Welcome to Dead Man Tolkien. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of Priestess of Spiders, from over on Reddit, No Sleep. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story and title. They dwell beneath. Let's get straight into that. The following documents have been compiled together in an attempt to present a clearer picture of the unusual events leading to the abandonment of Stevensville, Colorado on July 18th, 1987. The official explanation of the town's evacuation is an underground coal fire caused due to an unusually destructive and highly localized earthquake. With this evidence, I hope to change that perception. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, April 17th, 1987. The McClintock coal mine is digging a new mine shaft some time in the next month. Victor Briggs, the mine's foreman, states, The company has been looking to expand for some time now. The other shafts are no longer yielding as much coal. Increasing mechanization has been resulting in layoffs. Julian McClintock believes the best solution is to start a new shaft. Some recent geological surveys have hinted there may be a vast wealth of coal at the proposed location of Shaft 8. This expansion will bring in dozens of new jobs, something that this town desperately needs. Others, however, have less positive opinions on this development. A new mine shaft means more pollution and a greater reliance on fossil fuels, claims Diana Schneider, a chairwoman of the Thomas County Conservation Society. Our greed is destroying our planet. Just look at what has happened to the Larks Creek due to runoff from the mines already. We need to think about what kind of world our children are going to inherit. Mayor Mitchell had responded to the recent criticism, explaining, we need to focus on our citizens, not a bunch of trees. These environmentalists don't just understand that we need jobs far more, that we need a scenic view. If Miss Schneider is so concerned about the world our children are going to inherit, she should consider whether an impoverished child would rather have a pleasant view of food to eat. Julia McClintock, owner of the McClintock coal mine, could not be reached for comment. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, May 10th, 1987. Geologists baffled over recent earthquakes. Dr. Catherine Hendricks of the Thomas County Geological Institute is unable to explain the recent quakes that seem to be focused around Stevensville. It just doesn't make sense, says Hendricks. It doesn't line up with any of the geological information we have for this area. And the seismograph data is just bizarre. The quakes, which started earlier this week, have all been unusually powerful for this region, measuring an average of 4.6 on a Richter scale. While no injuries have been reported, the quakes have resulted in some noticeable shaking and loud rumbling. County authorities advise that residents of Stevensville should pack up and secure easily damaged valuables until further notice. Diary Entry of Ronald Winston, June 3rd, 1987 I've been moved over to work on Shaft 8 today. I didn't really mind. It's mostly the same work I've been doing for a while now, though some of the equipment is a bit newer. Management was right. There is a lot more coal in this area, and it seems of much higher quality as well. I'm also looking forward to the pay boost. More money for the same work, that's always nice. Well, the only thing that bugs me are two of the new workers. I think their names are Jim and Robert. Oh, it's just something off about them. They work the machines just fine, of course. Excellent, even. But they don't talk much, and they always have these stupid grins on their faces. And whenever I try to make conversation while we work, they just give me this blank stare, an idiotic smile, like they're looking right through me. I thought maybe it was just me, but I asked my buddy Charlie about it, and they seem freaky to him too. Or maybe they're on something. I don't know. I might bring it up with Victor. Diary Entry of Ronald Winston, June 4th, 1987 I spoke to Victor today, and the strangest thing happened. The conversation started out completely ordinary. Nothing seemed unusual. He asked me about the wife, how I was doing, etc. But when I brought up Jim and Robert, 
His eyes went blank, and he got the same stupid smile on his face. He just said something like, I don't mind them. They're just a bit shy, is all. There's nothing to worry about. I tried to elaborate, and he just repeated the same exact words. Same tone, verbalism. I left it at that and didn't press the issue. If I'm being honest with myself, it chilled me to the bone. He sounded like a different person, like some sort of machine instead of flesh and blood, a man. Just thinking about it gives me the creeps. I mentioned it to Charlie and he thought it was really weird. He thinks it might be some sort of bizarre prank or something, but I don't know. Diary Entry of Ronald Winsome, June 5th, 1987 I don't know if I can take much more of this. There is something deeply, terribly wrong happening here. Charlie is acting different now too. I've been working with this guy for years. I was excited when he got transferred over to the Shaft 8 with me. Happy to see a familiar face. But now, well now he has the same stupid smile and blank-eyed stare as Jim and Robert. He didn't even seem to recognize me when I said hi to him earlier. I hope this is just some stupid prank. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Diary Entry of Ronald Winsom, June 8th, 1987 I quit today. I just can't take it anymore. I got back from a weekend, hoping everyone would be just done with this damn joke, but well, it's gotten even worse. But Jim got his hands caught in one of the treads of the diggers. He nearly got his whole arm torn off. Well, I've seen accidents like this before. It wasn't the flesh tearing or blood spudding that got me shaken. It was how he reacted. He just stared blankly ahead, smiling like a goddamn moron, not so much as a flinch as the machine ripped half of his arm off. I put in my resignation at the end of my shift. I told them it was a two weeks notice, but I'm not coming in there again. I saw that same grin on Victor as I told him that I was going. The same blankness in his eyes. What the hell is going on? Letter from Dr. Jeremy Hopkins to his brother Andrew Hopkins, June 9th, 1987. Andy, I'm writing this to you today because I just need to get something off my chest. You've always been someone I could talk to when things have got rough and well, I really can't deal with the idea of bottling this up. We had a patient wheeled into ER yesterday. He had gotten his arm torn off in a mining accident. Well, I'll spare you the gory details, although you don't have much of a stomach for that stuff. Needless to say, the poor bastard was in a sorry state by the time we got to him. He had lost quite a bit of blood, but weren't sure he'd make it. Now you know me, Andy. I'm not one to get all riled up over something as simple as a severed limb, but that's not what bothered me. It was the fact that this man showed absolutely no signs of stress or shock whatsoever. He was just sort of smiling blankly, nothing behind his eyes. But strangely, it didn't seem like he was in any sort of catatonic state or anything like that. He looked around, even responded to questions, always speaking in a calm sort of voice. That damn smile, <laughs> it never left his face. Weirder still, sedatives didn't seem to work on him. We wanted to try and put him under the IV. It did nothing. I triple checked the needle. It was fine. No problem with the bag either. I even had the nurses change out the medicine just to see if we'd accidentally gave him a mislabeled saline. But it didn't matter. He just wouldn't fall unconscious. He kept staring at us as we worked to clean up the wound and stop the bleeding. And after he was stable, I gave him a proper examination. I wanted to take a look at his head, see if there was any trauma there that could account his utterly bizarre lack of pain or inability to fall unconscious. He bit me when I tried to. No change in that stupid smile or blank dull eyes. Just jerked his head towards me and bit me hard on her arm when I tried to. And after I finally got him off of me, I had the nurses tie him down and attempt to anesthetize, but obviously that didn't work. He just kept smiling and staring, even as he thrashed against his bonds. We had to basically tie him down to get a good look at him. Not that he ever stopped struggling. I finally did get a closer look at his head, and what I found puzzled me immensely. It was very faint, but around the circumference of his head was a thin white scar, all the way around like how a cartoon might depict someone getting brain surgery by just having the top of their head pulled off like the lid of a box. I barely even noticed it at first. It was so faint. It's hard thinking about what happened next. If I knew it would have turned out this way, 
I never would have done what I did. I wanted to get a look at his brain, figure out what had happened, if he would need surgery. We prepped the MRI machine and strapped him in. He just kept smiling and staring blankly ahead, gave no warning or anything. He didn't say anything at all when we pushed him into the machine. He didn't say anything as we flipped on the switch. He only started talking after it was too late. It was only once the machine started that he began screaming. He started shouting for help and begging us to stop. And then he said the words that will haunt me to the day I die. He shouted, They put something in my head! I tried to shut it off. I swear, I did everything right. But I must have got so panicked I fumbled just a little too long. Well, I know it's impossible, but it almost felt as if the machine was fighting back. I watched in horror as I saw his flesh start to writhe as if full of worms, his veins bulging as his eyes darted around. It could have only been a few seconds, but for me time seemed to pass like molasses. There was a sudden sense of calm on the patient's face, and then his head exploded, showering blood and bits of brain all over the inside of the machine. Scattered among the gore were dozens of intricate pieces of metal, rapidly crumbling into flat disks of metal under the intense magnetic force. I'm sorry. I know I said I wouldn't go into details, but I just had to tell someone. Now, the official explanation is that the patient had some shrapnel in the head that was previously unreported. I can't believe that. I didn't get too good of a look at whatever was inside his head before they were flattened, but it didn't look like any shrapnel I had ever seen. In addition, there was no record of the patient ever serving in the military. And any severe enough injury to leave that much metal inside his skull would surely be recorded somewhere. Someone did this to him. I had been given two weeks off for my mental health. I was hoping I could come visit you and Christine. I think I need to see some familiar faces after this experience. I'm sorry. Yours, Jeremy. Transcript of an interview with Dr. Natasha Albertson for the cancelled TV show Bizarre Mysteries, conducted January 13th, 2003. Interviewer is Arthur Dennings. So, Miss Albertson, we understand that you had an unusual experience with an autopsy in 1987. Well, that's why I'm here, aren't I? Why don't you tell us what happened? Well, that's a bit easier asked than answered, but I'll do my best. It was, if I had to guess, June 28th when I became directly involved. About a week or two earlier, a miner by the name of Roger Ainsley never returned home from the mine. According to his partner, he had been acting strangely for several days beforehand. Roger had been seeming to forget how to do basic tasks, smiling strangely at inopportune moments, and sometimes just stared at a wall for hours, seeming not to blink. His partner had considered getting him to see professional help, but as they were a gay couple in the 80s, that wasn't really an option for them. So he hoped it would just pass on its own and tried to do his best to take care of him. Then, one day, he just never came back after work. No explanation, no note, no nothing. He just didn't come back. From what I was told, security cameras didn't pick him up leaving the mine either. It was as if he just vanished. Did Roger Aisley have a history of mental illness or anything like that? Nope, none at all. He was considered by all who knew him to be mentally sound. He had no history of depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, nothing. He occasionally had a drink or a cigarette after his shift at a mine, but nothing that would count as an addiction. And as near as anyone could tell, he'd never taken any form of illicit substances. He just started acting weird out of the blue and then vanished. And uh, how did you come into the picture? Well, after a few days of no contact, Roger's boyfriend called the police. Of course, they found nothing. They suspected it fled town or something similar and didn't put a lot of effort into the search and a lot of sympathy for folks like us back then. Anyway, after a week or two, he just turned up out of the blue at the edge of the woods, stark naked and barely breathing. The kids who found him took Roger to the hospital, but by the time they got him there, the poor guy had already passed away. Now, at the time, I worked as a pathologist at the Thomas County Hospital, and so it was my job to perform an autopsy on him. I didn't have any knowledge of who he was at the time, 
since I didn't live in Stevensville, and word hadn't really gone on around yet. To me, he was just another John Doe. Uh, what did you find? There was a pause of around five seconds. Uh, nothing at first, not a mark on him beyond some scratches and whatnot, consistent with what someone would have wandering naked in the woods. He seemed a bit malnourished and dehydrated, but not too bad to have died. My thought at the time was an overdose of some kind, given how he was found. And that, well, that was my working theory, until I took a look at his skull. What was wrong with his skull? Well, there was this faint scar around the whole cranium, almost unnoticeable, unless you were checking very closely. It was way too precise to have been made with any technology at the time, unless somehow this working-class coal miner had gotten highly experimental treatment I hadn't heard about. I was at a loss, but it seemed to me almost as if it was some sign of brain surgery. And so I did what any self-respecting pathologist would do. I opened up his skull. What did you find? Nothing. Uh, you mean his brain seemed normal? No. I mean there was nothing in there. His skull? Oh, it was empty. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, July 3rd. 1987. Environmentalist group sues McClintock Mine. Thomas County Conservation Society announced plans this past Wednesday to sue the McClintock coal mine over alleged violations of the Clean Water Act. I've been out there by Larks Creek just yesterday, said Diana Snyder, chairwoman of the TCTS. All of the fish out there are horribly sick, and the water is this horrible purplish black colour. I can't believe that nothing has been done soon. When reached for a comment, Julian McClintock, owner of the McClintock coal mine, said in a letter to the press, I understand the concern of the TCCS, but there is nothing wrong. I personally invite Miss Snyder to visit our facility. I am sure it will put her mind at ease. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, July 7th, 19. 87. Environmentalist group retracts lawsuit. Diana Schneider, chairwoman of the Thomas County Conservation Society, issued a public statement Sunday retracting her previous vow to sue the McClintock coal mine. I've done a personal inspection of the facility, and there is no pollution of any sort. The facility is remarkably clean and environmentally friendly. There is nothing wrong. I apologize for misleading the public on this issue. Transcript from a broadcast of the radio show, Richard Ellison's Haunted America, July 10th, 1987. All right, folks, up next we have a caller by the name of Alice Hartford from Stevensville, Colorado, here to relate her experience living in a haunted house. Uh, thank you, Richard. I'm just so happy to be able to talk to someone about this. Ah, the pleasure is mine, Mrs. Hartford. So, tell me, when exactly did the troubles begin? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I first noticed something was wrong on the 4th of July, just under a week ago. My family and a couple of friends were celebrating with a barbecue in the backyard. Well, the beer had started to run dry, so I popped down into the basement to get some. We kept it down there to make sure my daughter doesn't see it lying around and mistake it for some pop. And then, well, you think I'm crazy. Ah, uh, trust me, Alice, whatever happened, you can tell me. My listeners and I make sure to keep an open mind about these things. Uh, well, I started to hear voices. There was an extended pause, around one to two seconds. I couldn't understand anything the voices were saying. It definitely wasn't English, just sort of strange sounds. But it was suddenly a voice. Why, I panicked so badly, why there were burglars. I ran all the way up the stairs and out of the house and told Mark to get down there. Uh, Mark is your husband? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. Oh, that's quite all right. Please, continue, Mrs. Hartford. Oh, he obliged me and even took that damn rifle of his, which scares me so much. But the voices, oh, they'd stop by the time he was down there. I was sure I was going crazy. Oh, as a matter of fact, it wasn't until two days later that I became convinced I just imagined it. Oh, why was that? Well, it was around midday. Mark was off at work and 
My daughter Jessica was at school. I was heading into the basement to put in a load of laundry when I heard those voices again. For a moment I was worried I was losing my mind, but I had an idea. I quickly set down the laundry and ran to Mark's office. He keeps a tape recorder there, you know, to take notes when he brings work home. Anyway, I bring it with me back to the basement and start recording. I was sure that if the recording could be heard afterwards, that I wasn't going nuts. And it worked. And do you still have this recording? Yes, just a moment. There are sounds of fiddling with a tape recorder, followed by harsh whispers in an unknown language. The voices simultaneously sound nearby and distant at the same time. And after this point, the recording degenerates into a high-pitched screech, followed by a thudding sound. The tape recorder clicks, and the recording ends. Why were those sounds at the end of the recording, Mrs. Hartford? Frankly, I'm not sure. I seemed to have blacked out around then. When I woke up, it was about three hours later, and I was lying face up in the basement. I had a nasty bump on the back of my head, so I figured I fell down the stairs. Have you heard the voices again since? Yes, nearly every night. I tried to tell my husband, but nah, he doesn't believe you. I'm not sure. I've tried to tell him. i even shown him the recording once or twice, but he just didn't seem to process the words. He just goes silent and smiles blankly until I change the subject. He doesn't seem to understand that he does it. That isn't the worst part, though. Why? What else happened? I told you I hear voices every night, and I mean that. But I haven't been purposely going down to the basement every night, Mr. Ellison. I just keep waking up there, as if I've been sleepwalking. I seem to wake up right before something dreadful will happen, because the voices keep sounding frustrated whenever I do. Once I even swore I saw something down there with me, and I still can't get it out of my head. Tell me what you saw. It was hard to see in the dark, but it was short, maybe about four feet tall. It looked human in an outline, more or less, but the proportions, they were all wrong. The limbs seemed thinner than they should be, and the head was far too large for its neck. The main thing I could make out were its eyes. These horrible, solar eyes that reflected a faint light coming from the open basement door. It seemed to panic when I noticed it. Then suddenly, I was back in my bed, with a horrible bruise on my temple. I must have hit my head on the way back to bed. That oh, was only last night. I'm horrified to think what will happen tonight. Anonymous Letter Sent to the 14 Magazine Unknown Phenomena January 7th, 1993 To the Editor I was reading an article about the underground coal fires from last February's issue, and I must protest. What happened in Stevensville on July 18th, 1987 was not a coal fire, at least not entirely. I am no geologist, nor can I say I have much knowledge in the mining industry at large. But there is no doubt in my mind that there was something more going on. I remember waking up that night to the sounds of screams. I ran outside to see what was happening and was greeted to a scene right out of hell. I saw dozens, maybe hundreds of people marching up towards the McClintock coal mine. Each of them was carrying another person, someone who was struggling to escape. They all marched in unison, staring straight ahead and smiling an inhuman artificial grimace which I hope to God I'll never see again. The people in their arms were begging to be let go, pleading to be put down. I saw one smiling marcher had both his eyes torn out by the person he was carrying, but all he did was keep walking like a goddamn robot. You ever see a bunch of ants moving in a straight line, looking at those dead-eyed automatrons, march minusly up the road? I was just like that. At some point, a police officer ran up to me and started explaining that it was a coal fire that I had to get out of here. Smoke was pouring out of the ground, and my vision started to get a bit hazy. I asked him why those people were being carried up to the mine, and he just looked at me with blank eyes and a mechanical smile and said, Everything is fine. It's all going to be okay. I got the hell out of there as soon as I could. I was worried that if I stayed, I'd get taken away too. I think I woke up too early. I don't think I was meant to see what I saw. I only started to hear sirens and police announcements via megaphone as I was leaving town. 
But the worst part wasn't the strange police officer, or the awful marches, or hell, even the whole damn town being evacuated. It was the thing I saw following the marches up the hill. I only caught glimpses, but, but I swear, I saw something else walking alongside them. Like I said, I didn't get a clear look. It was dark and smoky, and I was half asleep, but I know I saw it. It stood about the height of a child, and dressed in funny clothes, like the kind of uniform you'd see on one of those science fiction shows. I didn't get a clear look at its head, but I could see shiny black eyes and pale white skin. The thing moved wrong, as though it didn't have the same muscles and bones that we had. It vanished into the crowd after I got distracted by the eyeless marcher, but I swear, I saw it. I swear it was real. Everyone I tried to tell about this just thinks I was hallucinating from the smoke, but I know what I saw was real. I don't care if y'all believe me or not. That is for the readers to decide for themselves. But I'll be damned if I let this get swept under the rug. People have got to know. This final document is rather unusual. It is the most coherent entry from a journal kept by an unidentified individual who identified only as 251. 251 was found unconscious and unresponsive near the entrance of the Denver subway station on August 12, 1992. Following her recovery, 251 became homeless, unable to retain a job due to her mental illness. She died under unknown circumstances in the shelter on December 2, 1995. The extensive loss of public records owing to the devastating earthquake on July 18th means that this is an impossible to verify if 251 is a former resident of Stevensville, but a journal seems to support this conclusion. Most of the journal is unintelligible, consisting of strange symbols, scribbles, doodles, and strings of numbers and letters, but the entry below is relatively readable, if bizarre. Spelling and capitalization errors have been partially corrected for ease of reading. Journal entry of the individual known as W251. Date unknown. My name. My name, they took away my name. Carved it out and chopped it up and dissected it and put something else instead. Something metal and hard and sharp that I feel slicing my memories like a surgeon's scalpel. 251 is number designation, identity, differentiation. 251 was unimportant. Only the work I could perform for the sunless ones was important. And they are known by many names, Darrow and Cobalt and Grey. But to me, they are the sunless ones, for they hide away from the sun like skittering silverfish scuttling away from a dangling light bulb, hiding away in the hollow place came up through the mines first using radio waves and thought particles and whispers in the ear of the owner. His designation became 001, first of the ones they took. They had to leave him mostly intact, undamaged, because if others knew what they did, their plan would be for nothing. And so they came to him in dreams and visions and sounds, and he dug to them. He went down into the earth and pulled them out from the hollow place like they were called. The miners they took first needed total compliance, total control, sliced out of their souls and put in machinery and wires and radio. Partial conversations were best. The full conversions didn't fool anybody. Sometimes they'd just take out everything for fun and see how long they could last. Nobody cared. Nobody knew. The police were already quiet from the machines they had in their heads. Scars so small you could barely see them unless you were looking. I have one too. It was 7181987 that they came off from the ground to complete the quota. Going too slow, they needed builders and guinea pigs. Cut off all the phones and scrambled the radios and dug their way up. Had to be night, the sun burns the pale eggshell skin of the sunless ones. The already converted helped grab the rest. They did not need everybody, only needed a third. The rest could burn or run, it did not matter. I was taken down, down, down into the mine by the other converted and processed, scooped out old memories and put in rules and protocols and small ticking noises that prevented sleep. I worked and worked and worked for days and days and days. The sunless ones poked and prodded 
and laughed in a horrible, tittering way of the hollow place. Given slurry to eat and drink, just enough to keep alive to operate the machines. I could not think they took that part out, put in a transceiver just above the left eye. And it was near one of the machines when I broke, when the transceiver failed, pressing the right button at the right times for hours and hours. A nanosecond delay was not permissible, punished by pain. Shovel then dead into the machine. But something went wrong and the machine failed. It was so, so old, ancient, prehistoric, older than us by infinite magnitudes. A blast of rays and magnetism and the false brain in my head it shattered like glass. I was free to scream and cry and think and love and kill. I killed a sunless one. I bashed its bulbous head against the hard cold rock until the warm sour blood spilled like yolk from an egg and its cold black eyes were dead and still. I took the pain box and left to climb the miles high exit shaft into the blinding light of the upper world. I was free. Now I am broken and unable to be repaired. The right parts are missing miles and miles below the ground. There are entrances in the subways and the elevators and the forgotten sub-basements. But I am free and I will never go back. I just wish I still had my name. My despite request for its release, 251's autopsy report has not been made available. In addition, the so-called pain box device which 251 obsessively clung to throughout the final years of her life was found to be missing from police evidence. Of the 1,348 former inhabitants of Stevensville, Colorado, 447 remain unaccounted for. The entire town is abandoned and forgotten, save as an occasional inclusion on a list of ghost towns. The documents above are all that remains to indicate anything unusual beyond the simple coal fire ever occurred. Perhaps some things truly are better left buried. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an intriguing and thought-provoking story there from the incredible mind of Priestess of Spiders from over on Reddit, No Sleep. A huge thank you once again, Priestess, for allowing me to narrate your work on the channel. I love how each of your stories is different and intriguing in their own way. Of course, I hope you enjoy this rendition and look forward to more of your work in the future. Well, guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Oh, it really does help with the channel and our community further. And one at hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, of course, if you have a story to share on the channel, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As ever, guys and girls, I hope your family and friends and yourselves are well and happy and looking forward to that beautiful warm summer sun. A big thank you as always for your kind likes, shares and comments and continued support of the channel. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.